In late summer 2021, I found myself in Mozambique with Tyler Sharp, friend and editor-in-chief of Modern Huntsman. We had been tasked with telling the story of an incredible conservation endeavor, returning cheetah to the historic range. After an hour's helicopter flight from Beira on the coast of Mozambique, we arrived at the Cotada 11 concession, where two days later, the ecosystem's new residents would be arriving by private charter. Dylan, are you taking these to the Bomas now? They're all gonna go. Just gonna load another box in here. Okay. And then I think we're gonna start going. Okay. But these logistics are insane. <laughs> a lot of vehicles, a lot of people, a lot of cheetahs. This is the Into the Wilderness podcast and a special series brought to you from the field. This is a Modern Huntsman production presented by the Cabela Family Foundation. Before we get back to the excitement of this reintroduction, I wanted to understand more about a species I knew very little about. As manager for the National Cheetah Metapopulation for the Endangered Wildlife Trust, Vincent van der Merwe was the perfect person for this. But uh, yeah, they're completely unrelated to the roaring cats. Cheetahs actually evolved in North America. Um, so if you look at the pronghorn, the second fastest land mammal, uh, the, the speeds attained by the pronghorn evolved in, in response to predation by the North American cheetah. Which and, went extinct a long time ago. Yes, about two, three million years ago. It was called Mir Asinonics. There were two, subs, uh, two species that existed in North America. And then they crossed the Beringian land bridge between Alaska and Russia during a warm, sorry, uh, during an, uh, a cool, cool period when it was possible to cross there. And moved into Eurasia. And there were two species that existed in Eurasia uh, up to about a million years ago, including the largest cheetah that ever existed, which was the giant European cheetah. It weighed about 120 kilograms, the size of a female lion. Wow. So, like, to give, com by, by comparison, how much would these be weighing that we're releasing here? About uh, 30 to 50 kilograms. Oh, they're light. Very light. Uh, cheetah have become smaller over evolutionary time in the last uh, million years. Huh. <laughs> Very interesting. And they crossed into Africa sometime in the, in the past million years. Sadly, like so many species around the world, human impact, conflict, and land use change has been at the center of the cheetah population decline. But uh, yes, and South Africa was the most heavily colonized uh, country in Africa. So, so you can see, if you look at a map of South Africa, the colonials arrived, arrived in Cape Town. And as they moved upwards into the country, they completely decimated wild cheetah populations. Um, in the 1960s, we had just uh, 300 cheetah left in South Africa. 300? 300, yeah. Wow. And we're now on 1,300 wild cheetahs, um, just through reintroductions. And uh, it's been a wonderful thing to observe, you know, and it's all thanks to democracy and private land ownership and re re respecting property value. And, um, and Namibia has the largest cheetah population worldwide and a lot of problem animals on their livestock farms. Yeah. And we imported 300 of those cheetah into South Africa. Ah, okay. And that's how we started to grow our populations. Huh. And just in terms of uh, a more global perspective on cheetah, where else do you get cheetah and how many species of cheetah are there? So this is a very interesting question. Um, if a cheetah occurred widely across Africa, except for the forested areas, uh, jungle areas, uh, and uh, then they occurred throughout the Middle East all the way uh, to, to Burma and India, Bangladesh, and all the way north to Russia. In uh, Russia? Yeah, in 1979, huh. the last cheetah was seen in the Soviet Union. But is that the same cheetah that's here, or is this a different species? So that is, uh, yes, so they are, f f let me just get it right, uh, five, sub <laughs> so, so five subspecies okay. of cheetah. The front is camera switch. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> put the stuff away, grab the bags. So what's the plan now? Well, I think all the planes have landed and all the cheetahs are here. So now they're just loading them all up into the trucks and then we're going to the Boma, which basically is a man-made fence where they'll stay for a couple weeks, six weeks maybe to acclimate. So yeah, they're just loading them all up here now into the green mamba truck. <clears throat> All right, headed back to the Boma where we went this morning. Get these cheetahs settled in their new homes. Don, lay here. 
Because so these are the two big boys, they're the oldest cheetah that we've got here. Yeah? Four years and three years old. We're about to let the big boys out. I think it's a male and a female, and these will be the first two released. Um, let's see how they get out of here. <laughs> wow. Cheapest, they big boys. Yeah, they're the biggest. They're the biggest ones, yeah. <laughs> wow. Man, well, that's the first time I've been four feet from a cheetah sprinting out of a cage. Okay, everyone ready? Okay, go for it. And then the second leg. It's <laughs> really pretty, pretty damn cool. Definitely get your heart rate going to stand four feet from it. Four cheetahs sprinting out of the cage. Definitely the coolest thing I've done in a while. <laughs> I definitely have a whole new respect for these. The journey that you have just taken with the cargo that you have just transported is pretty special. Yes, this is a, a giant leap forward for, for, for our cheetah conservation project. You know, in South Africa and uh, in other parts of Southern Africa, uh, Malawi, uh, Zambia, we, we get access to small reintroduction sites, you know, ranging from 20,000 hectares to, to, to maybe 70,000 hectares. Maromeo, Zambezi Delta, where we are now, re represents 900,000 hectares of safe space for cheetah. So this is really a wonderful opportunity. This area has the ecological capacity to support 120 cheetahs. And this is our, by far our largest reintroduction. This journey actually started many days before because you had to go and catch these cheetah, yeah? Yes, yes, yes. So where, how, how come you were able, tell me about the population where they, they came from. Okay, so it all started um, way before I became involved in cheetah conservation. Uh, democracy comes to South Africa. And just be, before democracy, uh, there was change in legislation in South Africa that o allowed landowners to own the wildlife on their property. So democracy came and there was this tourism boom in South Africa. And a lot of agricultural land switched to conservation, ecotourism. People actually made more money out of ecotourism than agriculture. So they brought in lions, leopards, cheetahs, reintroduced them onto these large uh, farms, which were previously mainly cattle farms and created what we call a meta-population. So, so basically there was this tourism boom and uh, these tourists were willing to pay lots of money to come and see these animals. And the condition that government gave to these privately owned and, of, and some of them were state-owned reserves what, is that you have to fence these reserves. And the moment you fence a reserve, you fence humanity out. And, uh, so it's like, this is fortress conservation. Fortress conservation, absolutely. Uh, which is against the current conservation paradigm. Everyone's looking at coexistence at this point in time. So we're very much against the current paradigm in conservation. When, we're not personally against it, but the, this project that we inherited was due to fortress conservation. And, um, but that was of the time, right? Like everything from the colonial era onwards kind of brought that with, with, with the national park system, which actually was inherited from the Americans. Yeah. Yes. So put a, you can visit it, but you can't live in it anymore. Absolutely. Yeah. And, 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 and obviously if you fence humanity out, you take out the greatest danger to cheetahs. And uh, so these cheetah populations started to flourish. Uh, but because they're such small reserves, my, I was employed initially simply to do cheetah swaps between reserves to prevent inbreeding. Ah, okay, because this is one of the major issues with these fenced areas. Even big fenced, relatively speaking, big fenced areas is you don't have this genetic flow. Exactly. Uh, long gone are the days of the wide open spaces for animals to move freely. Uh, uh, we now stuck with these small little islands. <laughs> we, we've got company. Yeah. We, we drove out to the middle of the airstrip so that we wouldn't be disturbed and clearly somebody's seen. <laughs> let's see, let's see what's happening. Maybe we're off to go and collar a leopard already, I don't know. We weren't off to collar a leopard. That's coming in a later episode. But once we got back to the interview, Vincent expressed his hopes for the project. A reintroduction of cheetah in an open, unfenced system. If there's one place in Africa where the coexistence model could work, it's Maromeo. 
And that's because the hunters have a very healthy relationship with the surrounding community. They give them meat, they give them uh, medical supplies, they give them, uh, uh, you know, they've uh, improved the schooling in the uh, surrounding area. And uh, this means that they have a healthy relationship with the surrounding community, which means we could actually get the coexistence model right here. But where did it all start? In a world fraught with mass population declines and habitat loss, how did this Garden of Eden come into existence? Conservationist Ivan Carter gave us the backdrop to the current success and introduces Mark Haldane. 30 years of civil war meant a complete collapse of the infrastructure in this country. And one of the things a lot of people don't realize is the word for animal and the word for meat in many, many African languages is the same word. And so it, it's a derivation of the word nyama. So nyama means animal and it means meat. And what that tells you is a tribal person looks at an animal as food first. So when a, country, a country's infrastructure collapses and there's no food, the first thing that people look to is the wildlife for food. So at the end of a 30-year civil war, this area was almost devoid of wildlife. There was no lions. They'd all been killed by poaching, um, but they were killed as a byproduct because people would set these snare lines. So a snare is a, 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 like a wire noose or a trap. And they would, they would line, make these long lines several miles long of brush with gaps in it and a snare in every gap and then push the animals towards it. So the lions would hear an animal in a trap, walk around as they do and walk into a trap of their own. So the lions all disappeared. Most of the leopards disappeared. And you could walk around or drive around or fly around on the floodplain and there was very few animals. Mark Haldane came into this area and he's, he's an incredible leader. He's an incredible visionary. And he's also a guy who's very, very tenacious. All right. I first arrived here in 1994, pretty much by chance. Um, I was meant to do a safari in Botswana, which for a long story got cancelled. And I had a very uh, adventurous client called Philippe de Jonge from Belgium. And I phoned him. I said, our Botswana leopard hunt has been cancelled due to a debacle on quota and a bit of dishonesty. What do you want to do? He said, I don't care as long as it's somewhere that's wild. I don't want to go anywhere where I see a fence. The wilder, the better. I'd heard about Mozambique and uh, I'd been up here to have a look a little bit um, unsuccessfully at areas. And I knew a chap called Anton Marais who had this block in partner partnership with my current partner, Carlos. So I phoned Anton and I said to him, I'd like to come and do a hunt up there. He said, man, I'd be so happy if you do. So we're battling up there. It's battle to get clients there. The war's just over. Everyone's petrified of landmines. Um, go and have a look. And then I want to talk to you. So off we came here. <clears throat> we arrived here. It was one of the wilder places I'd ever been to. Um, we landed on the strip here. We came in a little charter plane all the way from Johannesburg, at Cherokee 6. It took like half the day to get here. Uh, I came in with one Australian client and my friend Philippe, and uh, we were on a buffalo hunt. Um, the buffalo hunt was very successful. Uh, we've, the quotas were tiny. At that stage, there were only about 1,200 buffalo in the delta, um, but there was a big herd right on the edge, and they only had three or four hunts that year, so it was pretty successful. Man, it was an understatement. I absolutely fell in love with the area. Not so much the game because we saw precious little. We saw the buffalo, so those made an impression on me. Um, I didn't fully realize at the time how low the buffalo population actually was. And uh, the other animal that was relatively plentiful was the Sunni, because during the war, all the local villages were, were displaced by the war. They were forced to move into, into the larger villages where they could be controlled, where they couldn't supply uh, the rebels with food, uh, uh, and and the government could give them some form of protection. So the military on both sides, rebels and the military, and on top of it, the Russians that were involved here, they wouldn't waste a, a bullet on a little Sunni or a Red Dyker. So those little chaps were pretty much spared. Um, so we had a great safari. Both clients came in here, both got buffalo, had a good time, both got Sunni. But I tell you what, we hardly saw a warthog or a reed buck. I mean, it was just, it wasn't here. I went home, Anton phoned me, he said, what did you think of the area? I said, I loved it. He said, well, why don't you buy me out? <laughs> it was that quick. He said, I'll practically give it to you. I'm done. 
And he'd had a rough time. He'd been here since 92. He'd even been taken hostage by the rebels wow. for three days. Um, and then realizing that he was, you know, probably on the right side. They, they, well, not on the right side. He was not involved in either side. They released him. Um, I said, well, I'd come and I'd get involved, provided he stayed involved, because he was a, an existing safari operator. Nobody really wanted to come to Mozambique in those days. And we needed sort of 10 or 15 safaris a year to make this work. So he reluctantly agreed to stay in. He practically gave me my shares in the operation. And uh, that all came together from 94. Took a while for me to get written up officially in the in the share certificates and that, but I essentially ran the operation from 94. So fortunately, we had a pretty strong Botswana operation and South African. And my brother, who's involved with me, and it, my younger brother, I said, listen, this is not going to make us any money for a while, but it will eventually uh, be the crown of our operation if we look after it, because it's truly wilderness. And there is definitely a movement towards these unfenced little, you know, operation. So we agreed. Um, the first thing we did was we established an anti-poaching unit because there were lots of signs of poaching in those days, big snare lines with a hundred snares in them. So I got a little anti-poaching unit going and the professional hunters, when they weren't hunting, actively went and did anti-poaching with the guys. And it suppressed it, you know, we made a bit of an, a bit of an impact. Um, a scientist, an American scientist called Dr. Richard Belfus, came and did one of the first game counts here. And we were chatting, and he said to me, there's a phenomenon that's played out throughout the world, that when an area's wildlife is absolutely plundered, the remaining little pockets of wildlife all gravitate towards the area of the best habitat and the best protection. And that just so happened to be here. So those first years, we, we had roughly 1,200 buffalo in the swamps. There were probably another 100 scattered around the forests. We knew of five zebra. Five. Uh, five, just okay. five zebra. Um, 44 sable. We had one herd of 44 sable. And then a couple of satellite bulls out there. You would maybe see a warthog once a week. Um, reedbuck, you probably see one reedbuck a day if you're on the floodplains. Um, water buck, I mean, you've seen them now when we fly over there, thousands. Loads, yeah. We used to get one water buck on quota, and most years we didn't one. shoot it. Huh. Not because we were great conservationists, it was because we couldn't find one to shoot. <laughs> so that's kind of what we started with. And uh, as old Richard Belfast predicted, the game started to gravitate back. And with our protection, we didn't stop the poaching, but we suppressed it. <clears throat> and the game responded incredibly well. And every year we had these amazing... Um, increments. And, you know, before we knew it, we were up there into incredible numbers. Today, I'm told by some of the, the, the guys that are involved with Sable that we have the highest free range population in Africa, which That's is incredible. Ar around 3,000. Yeah. And you said that from 40 odd animals? F from 40 odd. Now, look, more would have gravitated yeah. in here, um, but certainly if you go to our herds in September, every cow's got a little cough. So, so the numbers are. are incredible you know we can't a sable don't like high density of game so we can't really go more than this our neighbors in area 14 had no sable that they knew of they've now got a reasonable population of have, sable. have they spilled over from here they've spilled over area 10 also had no sable that they knew of probably as recently as 15 years ago and now they've got a fantastic population they do a good job in area 10 look after their game and it's come back greatly spilled over from here. The wildlife population recovery Mark describes is an incredible success, but they weren't gonna stop there. There were species missing from this landscape, in particular, big apex predators. As Ivan Carter explains. You know, they occurred all the way through Asia. In fact, they evolved in North America, um, all the way through Asia, all the way to India, all the way across Africa, everywhere in Africa that wasn't forest had cheetah. And now they've become one of the most endangered. And so really, I think as conservationists, we owe it to the species. We've got this available landscape. We should be doing everything to bring that landscape back to once it, what, what it once was. And I think, Byron, you can boil that down by 
by simply saying, what is the meaning of conservation? So people will tell you, well, conservation is anti-poaching. Yes, that's true. It's collaring animals. Yes, that's true. It's translocations. Those are all true. But the holistic meaning of conservation is conserving the entire biodiversity of a system, a healthy system at that. This area used to have cheetah. It should have cheetah today. They were exterminated at the hand of man. And today, man is putting them back. So I believe that as a conservationist, it's almost... It's our mandate to do everything we can to recover these ecosystems and get them back to once to what they once were. And so we we partnered with Endangered Wildlife Trust with a gentleman by the name of Vincent van der Merwe, who truly is a cheetah expert. And what a gentleman. Oh, he's a great guy. <laughs> we podcast with him yesterday. Yeah, no, I mean, I just wanted to speak to him for another two hours. And there's a guy driven and motivated by his own passion for the species I mean, there's nothing that I, I, I haven't learned half of what he's already forgotten about Cheetah. So he was a fantastic partner. And what we, what we started off with was some conversation two or three years ago, actually. And that conversation began with Vincent, confirming that Cheetah had indeed historically existed where they now hope to reintroduce them. So we just, you know, we had this expanding population and we needed to uh, 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 re relocate surplus animals to other parts of, of Africa because otherwise we were going to have to either euthanize or we were going to literally have to um, contracept. Ah, okay. Yeah. So this is the, there's, the, there's two stories here. So one is your ability because of increasing populations to put animals somewhere else, but you also actually had a problem. Yes, a surplus ah, of cheetahs. Ah, okay. <laughs> And Malawi was our first uh, re reintroduction site. Uh, the reserves there were fenced by African parks, and we relocated cheetahs to Malawi. And as soon as they landed, they took off. Uh, the population started increasing and created more problems okay. because what we were going to do with the surplus in Malawi now? Yeah. Yeah. And um, and then and then we started looking elsewhere. So I was actually driving down from Malawi back to South Africa, and I heard about this place called Marameo. And I phoned up uh, Mark Haldane, uh, the manager of Qatar 11, and um, I said, look, I'd love to just come and have a look uh, and, and see what this place is all about and, and to investigate prospects for introduction. Mm. And he said, no problem. And he whisked me off in his helicopter and I saw those floodplains and I said, we are good to go. <laughs> <laughs> it is a go. <laughs> the problem is, he said to me, Vincent, I want proof of the historical presence of the, of the species in this uh, area. Ah, yeah. okay. And that was, of course, a big mission because Mozambique wasn't a heavily colonized country and not many hunters and colonials really moved through these areas uh, because this area was, of course, heavily infested with malaria and, and sleeping sickness and all kinds of horrible things historically. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went down to the uh, Maputo uh, Natural History Museum and we found some old Portuguese literature that spoke about a cheetah population close to Kiliman but didn't give any real specifics. Now, Kiliman is about 200 kilometers north of here. So I delved a little bit more into the lit Portuguese literature with translators and we didn't find much. And eventually I thought, okay, the only place is to go to the largest library worldwide. And that's the British Library in London. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we marched in there and it was a wonderful experience. Uh, you know, it's just such a massive library. It's yeah. insane, that place. <laughs> it's a really wonderful place and good internet connection. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike out here, which is what we want when we're out here, to yeah, be fair. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yes, uh, we went and we got dug through the literature and I found this book called Wild Game Hunting on the Zambezi, written by a British chap called Malgam in 1950. You know I'm going to have to look this up now. <laughs> <laughs> we both need this in our library now. <laughs> and I started reading the book and I went, I went to the index and I looked up Cheetah and I couldn't believe it. Boom, there it was. Really? Page, page 1915. 1915. 1915. Uh, page 178, Wild Game Hunting on the Zambezi. Man, you have a good memory. <laughs> <laughs> but why, I mean, why was this clearly such a burden of importance for Mark? And, I mean, was it important to you before he had mentioned it, making sure that there was a historical range here? Yes, if you want to do cheetah reintroduction responsibly, you know, you first want to check that the species survived here yeah, historically. For any species, I guess. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that, you know, because we knew that if we're going to proceed with this reintroduction, uh, other organizations, co conservation organizations are going to ask questions. Yeah. 
and you want to have that evidence, you know. And um, so this Malgam chap was marching along here in 1905. The book was published in 1915, but uh, he came through this area in 1905, and he saw a battalion, um, sorry, a martial eagle bombarding something at the mouth of the Zambezi, where it goes into the sea. And um, as they did in those days, he shot the martial <laughs> eagle. Of course he did. <laughs> <laughs> And um, remember, people, Darwin shot a lot of stuff too. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And this bird came crashing down, and they went to uh, collect it. And what did they find? It was bombarding three young cheetah cubs. Okay. And that was our proof of the historical presence of cheetah in, in the Zambezi Amazing. Delta. Yeah. <laughs> and then Mark gave the thumbs up. Okay. And, um, so now it was a go. Now it was a go. Now it was a go. And then we had to, of course, do the bureaucracy, uh, the import permits, export permits, but we had to identify 10 suitable cheetah for reintroduction. Ideally, so what does suitable mean? So lion have obviously been reintroduced into the Delta, which mm. is the uh, main… whole other story here. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. They're the main killers of cheetah, lion. So in South Africa, 45% of our, our cheetah mortalities are due to lion. Wow, I didn't realize it was as high as that. Yeah. No, lion are the principal killers of cheetah. And 9% due to leopard. And then uh, um, we're not sure how how much cheetah mortality is due to spotted hyena, but we lose a lot of cubs to. We're pretty confident that it's in, somewhere in the vicinity of 15 to 20% of, of, of wild cheetah mortality due to hyena, just hyenas eating cubs in, mm. in the dense side. So they've got a lot against them. Yes, they really are the underdogs of the large carnivore world. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And under, under cats. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, yeah, we had to identify hard predator savvy cheetah to survive here. Ah. So, we, we couldn't go to a soft reserve where cheetah haven't seen competing predators before. We had to get hardy animals. Like, this is a big cheetah I'm seeing with a big shaggy mane. <laughs> <laughs> so, they needed to be smart, basically. Exactly. We call it predator savvy. Okay. And we went and we identified 10 individuals, two from uh, 12 individuals, two from Malawi, and 10 from South Africa. And. Um, yeah, and then I had to go capture these cheetah on seven different reserves across southern Africa. So how long did that take? That took us about two months to, wow. to gather all these cheetah up. And uh, it was it was quite a, a, a nerve-wracking experience because the first two we caught were the two females in Malawi. And we got them in the Boma and I phoned uh, Mark and Ivan Carter, who are the coordinators of the <coughs> conservation efforts here. And uh, they said to me, uh, fantastic, well done. We've got the two Malawi cats. And th the next day, a pride of lions walked past the boma where we'd put these two Malawi cats into and spooked these two females. And the one ran into the fence and broke her neck. So that was, that was a big, you know, a big, you know, these wildlife reintroductions are a roller coaster ride. You know, it's mm. highs and lows. And um, this was obviously a big low point. And they said, don't worry, Vincent, carry on with the project. We still got the one female from Malawi. Proceed with the capture of the 10 animals in South Africa. And so off we went and we caught our first female in, in the Free State, which is a very different habitat to here. Yeah, vast open grassland plains, temperatures reaching minus 8 in winter. And we caught a female there and we relocated her to a quarantine facility in Zululand where we were going to store all the 10 cheetahs from South Africa. And halfway through the journey, she, she died uh, from capture stress. So of the, the first three cats that we caught, we'd lost two already due to various complications. But that's, it's sad. And obviously, everybody wishes that doesn't happen. But that is, there's always going to be a, a risk of mortality in any big capture or, or any conservation endeavor on this kind of scale right absolutely you know and uh, I, I don't think that's very well articulated to the, the wider world we see all these amazing successes all the time but there's actually a price to pay sometimes exactly uh, wildlife reintroductions are inherently risky and most conservationists are not willing to go ahead with it because you are going to lose animals and, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, we pick up a lot of flack for it. Uh, we've lost over 40 cheetahs over the past 10 years, relocating them between reserves due to capture stress. I mean, these are wild-born cheetahs. They've never been in a confined space before. You stick them into a 0.5 by 1 meter crate. You know, it's a very stressful experience. Yeah. 
and we lose animals, you know. And um, but you're concerned about the species more than you're concerned about the individual. As much as you are concerned about the individual, the end goal here is the conservation of the species. You've got to look at the bigger picture, absolutely. And at the end of the day, despite all these losses, we are still winning. Our cheetahs are genetically healthy, and the population is growing. So, so that's what we what we're aiming at. And um, and then after that, we, we managed to find a one replacement female for the one we'd lost. And we proceeded with the capture of the other eight cheetahs. And we got all eight safely to the quarantine bomas. It was basically a month of driving around, capturing helicopters. Darting. Darting, driving late nights, emailing permits, bureaucracy. You would be forgiven for thinking the biggest hurdle was capturing the animals. But the logistics are insane. You need to have a very specific vet that darts them. You need to have permits to dart them in the different provinces where they they originally occurred. You have to have permits to move them. You have to have permits to hold them in a new province. You have to have import permits into the new province. You have to have a, a quarantine permit for your BOMA. You have to have a CITES export permit that's got to match with a microchip that was inserted when they were first touched. You've got to have the export permits, you've got to have a tax document to prove that you're exporting valuable goods and, and how that's being paid for. Then on the Mozambique side, you've got import permits, you've got CITES permits, you've got veterinary permits. So all of these permits, and these countries don't talk to each other, Byron. So <laughs> Mozambique was calling for permits from South Africa that hadn't been issued yet. South Africa was saying, well, we won't issue an export until you have an import. And so we'd go to the import people and they say, well, we can't give you an import until you give us your CITES permit. We'd go back to South Africa and say, well, we're not going to give you a CITES permit until you've got an export permit, which we can't get until we've got the import permit. And so this whole mess, as much of a bowl of spaghetti as it sounds like when I'm telling you, it was like that. I mean, right to the 11th hour, Vincent was on the phone, phoning inspectors, trying to get permits. We actually put a vehicle on the road. Our permit to export the cheetah was written at two o'clock in the afternoon the day before we exported them at seven o'clock the following morning. <laughs> Talk about on the wire. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, it's just conservation is like that. And conservation is hard. And it takes an incredibly tenacious team to say, okay, well, that's not a problem. We just put a car on the road. And let's drive for seven hours and go and get this permit. Mm. You just, know, just, just making it happen. Make it happen. And that's exactly what they did. And two days later, after the commotion of everyone arriving and the cheetah being released into the bomas, I sat with Tyler, Ivan and Vincent and watched these magnificent animals feed. That's okay. Nervous is actually good. Yeah. That's the brave ones. That's <laughs> the horses, yeah. Are they from the same area? Are they acquainted? No. no. no, no. So there's... Okay. The one with a short tail, he, yeah. his brother was killed by a lion. Okay. And then we thought we'd just bond him with another young male. Okay. And then we bonded them and they... I mean, we, yeah, we, Close enough. Yeah, we're not sure if, yeah. if we open the gates, will they stay together or not? Yeah. It's not a bad thing because if they stay together, then the dominant male always breeds, which means you get one set of genetics. Okay. But if they move as a, a, two, a unit of two, then you, you, you get more genes into the gene pool. Okay. So. Now, how much? Did, did they already eat some? today yeah they, yeah they got a leg each okay. so they're still hungry yeah. okay and a cheetah needs 15 kilograms of pure meat not bones and skin okay you know, pure meat uh, every three days okay uh, then they can go without meat for up to eight nine days but then that's when the body condition tapers yeah. Up. yeah and then if they don't eat for 20 days and they that's it mm -hmm. they die Will he eat all of that, or he'll leave some? Ah, uh, yeah, he'll probably yeah, he's, he'll probably leave some for the other, other yeah. guy. Yeah, because he's already had about mm -hmm. eight kgs. So eat another five there, and then the other boy will come in now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine trying fifteen kilograms of meat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a Saturday night. Isn't yeah, it? I was gonna say maybe maybe <laughs> Christmas Day. What had become <laughs> abundantly clear in the time we were in Mozambique? was the sacrifice, dedication, and care everyone had, not only to this project, but to conservation as a whole. The gravity and depth of what this means to the people on the ground was brought home as we continued to speak to Ivan Carter. As you listen to him talk, appreciate the pauses and the silence as he gathered his emotions to tell us the story. And you open those crates and these 
these animals that are just they so dependent on conservation you know you see those animals you see them in this landscape for the first time and you look at the beauty of them and you look at how they design they design they the the ultimate speed animal and you you look at that and you just think wow we've as a team we've put these things back this means a lot to you Ivan. it does yeah. but and you've been involved in a lot of stuff over the years why does this mean so much what is it about this and this place You know, I think what it is, is when you put, when you put so much effort Let me, let me back out a little bit. When, when you put a lot of effort into a landscape, whether it's finding money, whether it's anti-poaching, whether it's hours and hours of planning and preparation, and you start to see these massive steps. You know, when you start to see these massive steps that everybody tells you are impossible, and you realize that you've played a small role in them, and you realize the, the, the strength of the team that you surrounded with. You know, I think, I think it, it's, it's something that very few people get to do, which is to have this amazing impact on a landscape, on, on the people in the landscape, on the species you're putting into the landscape. And I think that, you know, it's one of those deals where the, the, the more you, the harder you work, the sweeter the reward. And so, you know, it's, it's very seldom that one doesn't get emotional when you've, you're talking about a giant conservation success. You know, whether it's the, the, the first cheetah to leave their tracks in, in a landscape like this, whether it's when you watch a herd of elephants walking off a truck, you know, whatever it is, you realize that there's so many people out there that don't even try because it is so hard. And you surround yourself with the right team and it doesn't make it easier, but it makes it possible. You know, and so I think that as, as you see those cheetah run out of the crate, you guys were there, you filmed it, you photographed it, it you realize that this is the spectacular animal. It's probably the, the best designed predator on the planet. It's, it's, it's the perfect design. It's not to say that it's any better design th than a lion, but when you look at how well designed that is and the fact that they were completely extinct in this area and, and we've... We've brought them back and, and we have this opportunity to, to, to have this impact. I think that's a big deal. It's something that... There's another truck. You know, it's, it's something that's way bigger than just, okay, well, we put Cheetah back into this area, you know. And I think that if you've got people around you that are equally passionate, if, I, if Clyde the pilot had said, you know what, this is too hard. My pilots are not eating. We're not flying the next leg. It would have failed. If Vincent had said, well, we haven't got a permit, it would have failed. If we hadn't been able to talk the inspector into waking up at three o'clock in the morning and driving to the airport because his car had broken the day before, it would have failed. And there's, there's these, these, you're on the brink of failure for 48 hours. Because as I always say, and I, I joke about it, it, Mark said, how's it going? I said, the gremlins are popping up, but I'm killing them as fast as they can come. <laughs> and that's what you're doing. Yeah. You're putting out fires in every direction, whether it's permits, whether it's, you know, somebody lost the gate code to get into the gate or, you know, one of the crates is not working properly or, you know, the, the, the vet's drugs got left in the sun and we had to replace them at short notice, whatever it might be. There's a thousand things that can go wrong with this thing. And having the kind of, I guess you could call it the lead position on that, where you've got these teams that you have to just trust them. And on purpose, I don't scratch in Vincent's salad when he's 
on the front line. I let him do his thing because he's the best there is at it. He keeps me updated, but I'm not going to try and phone the permit guy. I'm not going to try and get the permits. That's his deal. I'm not going to get into Clyde stuff about, well, we thought we were going to have three cheaters on this plane, but we've got four and now our car goes wrong. And that's his deal. You've got to trust those. And so surrounding yourself with a team that you truly trust, I think, is the the way that you make these things happen, you know. And and so, yeah, it's a, it's a big deal when it works. These incredible conservation efforts are, of course, only possible with support and unsurprisingly, large amounts of funding. And that, as it turns out, is where some of the more controversial aspects of this conservation success lies. Because none of the story we were here to tell would have been possible without money from hunters, as Vincent begins to explain. Uh, yeah, they say, uh, you know, in your 20s, if you're not uh, a liberal, you don't have a heart. Uh, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and if you're in your 30s and you don't have, if you're not a, you know, a capitalist, you don't have a, a brain, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, what we've realized is that, um, you know, without the, 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 the conservation dollars coming in, it's impossible to protect these last few remaining natural uh, landscapes in Africa. And Marome is a prime example of an area that cannot bring in dollars through ecotourism because it's flooded for six months of the year. Yeah. So your only option here to bring in those conservation dollars is to engage with the hunters. And the hunters are quite, you know, they're quite an easy bunch to please. You don't have to put them in a fancy lodge. They're happy to come and stay in a tent in a rugged uh, environment and to spend their money. And, and it's um, a lot of money. It's a lot of money. It's yeah. a lot of money. And they employ a lot of people in the process. They uplift the local communities uh, socially and economically. And they come and have a good time. And, um, and it's a pleasure to work with the hunters because they do us. they movers and shakers. They... Um, you know, they, uh, they, they, they. A big problem with a lot of the work that we we do is that, um, you know, we we come across a lot of risk averse conservationists, hands off conservationists. Just leave it, don't touch it. But we've completely transformed the landscape in Africa. We really, you know, because of the anthropogenic destruction of the landscape, we have to now. It's our responsibility to manage the yeah. damage that we've done. Absolutely. To encourage gene flow between the few remaining fragments of of, of habitat, or natural habitat in Africa. So you you really do need movers and shakers and doers and yes, let's go people and 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 and, and the hunters are exactly that. And it's um, you know they've created here yeah, for us nine hundred thousand hectares of safe space. I mean, if you came to this place uh, to Maromeo thirty years ago. Uh, the, the, the wildlife was completely wild, wiped out by 15 years of civil war. Mm. And the hunters have come in here and they've rejuvenated this place. Similar sentiments were shared by veterinarian Joao Armeida, who you'll be hearing from more later as we head out to collar lions. And, and what I like is it's, it's, um, it's a different type of funding. That it's very different from, like, if I work with conservation NGOs and it's all the same circles. Same circles of funding, you know, a smaller, an NGO like mine gets funding from a bigger NGO that gets funding from two or three big NGOs. And it's all the same people, the same relationship, it's the same type of money. What I like about the projects here in the Zambezi Delta Conservation and, and that Ivan does, it's it's totally different money. And that's very healthy, I think. Um, and, and the money that comes to support this area, it's uh, not only different, but is very significant and... Um, and it involves individuals that um, are all fighting for the same goal. And so in terms of scale, it's, I mean, it's the, it was the largest line translocation ever. It was the largest cheetah translocation. The way that things are done for the long term, it, you don't see that often. So the line translocation happened in 2018, but still 2021, there's a massive budget of helicopter hours for monitoring. There's a continuous budget for coloring of the animals availability of wildlife vet services and budget for that. So things are done really, really well and with a long-term vision, not just we do it once and then see how it goes. This conversation was a common theme through our stay at Katada 11. And Tyler brought this up with Ivan. It's also incredible that a conservation success story like this is funded through hunting dollars, or, or at least dollars that are working in conjunction with you know, sustainable hunting operations. Absolutely. And, and I think it's an incredible example to be able to, to point to and, and put 
not on a pedestal, right, but but put at the forefront of of how these things can work together as a way to address, you know, the 80% of the global population who doesn't hunt and say, look, you know, this is, don't always believe what you hear. These are things that, that can be done and only done in this case with, with the cooperation totally. of organizations. And I, I always call those the, the uncomfortable truths because sometimes it, the world around us today wants the comforting lie. They don't want the uncomfortable truth. So don't worry, it's all gonna be okay. Hunters are bad people, don't worry. Join us for the next episode when we carry on this story, hearing from the Cabela family who made this whole project possible before we jump in a helicopter and dart lions as part of the Zambezi Delta monitoring program. Until then, read extracts from the story on social media by following at Modern Huntsman, or read the story in full by visiting the website to order a copy of Volume 8 at www.modernhuntsman.com. <laughs>